Uh, all right. Yeah. So we, we are very happy to welcome uh, Pablo Andujar Guerrero, uh, who will uh, talk about types and definable compactness in no minimality and beyond. Thank you very much, Christian. It's uh, great to be talking in this seminar. Of course, uh, we would have hoped he could have done it in person, but maybe maybe in a few more weeks. Let's go back to, to how it was maybe last semester at Fields. So this is going to be a 45 minute talk, more or less. And what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to basically present a result of mine about types in a minimal structures. And I'm going to talk about how this result characterizes a notion of the pineable compactness or the pineable topologies in the minimal setting. And then I'm going to move into the beyond part. Uh, and what I'm going to do essentially is discuss whether this result might generalize to other settings beyond a minimality. And what I'm essentially doing here is I'm talking a bit about the things that I would like, or some of the things that I would like to be working on during the next weeks and months at Fields. So hopefully by the end of the semester, uh, we'll have some answers about, about some of the questions I'm going to be addressing. Now uh, I'm saying this is work with Will Johnson because these topics, they are mostly things that I've been discussing with him during the last year. And I'm going to talk a bit about some of his, some of his results uh, on, the, on the topic. So before anything, we have to establish some conventions, which are things that most of you are very comfortable with, but I'm gonna mention them anyways. So throughout M is gonna be our structure and everything is going to be in M. The final is going to be, is going to mean in M, possibly with parameters. I'm going to be talking constantly about the finable family subsets, often denoted with, uh, with the curly S. And by that, I mean a uniformly definable family, which is, of course, a family given by some formula, phi x, y. And then the uh, curly S is essentially the fibers of the set defined by phi in our structure M. Now, a family of sets is consistent, consistent meaning finally consistent. If every finite intersection of sets in S is non-empty, types are always complete and over M, and we adopt the convention of considering types to be consistent families of the finable sets. So instead of focusing on the formulas on a type, we focus on the sets defined by those formulas in our structure M. So in particular, an n-type n -type becomes an ultra filter in the Boolean algebra of the finable subsets of M N. And finally, we have the definition of the finable type, which is going to be very important. A type Px is definable if for every formula phi xy is set, the set of, uh, of parameters that index sets in the type is definable. So essentially, a type is definable is whenever, if whenever you restrict it to any given formula, the restriction is a definable family of sets. So, what is the main theorem I'm going to be talking about? First, let me introduce two quick definitions. A family of sets, S is downward directed. If for any two sets in the family, there is a third one that is a subset of their intersection. And for convenience, I'm also going to assume that S does not contain the empty set. Moreover, given two families of sets, S and F, we say that F is finer than S. If for any set in S, there is another one in F that is a subset. So with this, we come to the main result of this talk. I'm gonna call it theorem A, and it says the following. Let M be a minimal, the following holds. First, every downward directed definable family of sets extends to a definable type, right? So in general, in a structure, you might have a definable family of sets that doesn't extend to a definable type, but what I'm saying is, as long as that family is downward directed in a minimal structure, it is always going to extend to a definable type. And the second part says the following, for any definable type P and any definable family of sets S in P, there exists a downward directed definable family F also in the type that is finer than S. So I might refer to two by saying, any, any family S in P can be refined to a downward directed family. 
So this is the result, and I'm going to ask that you try and remember this result throughout the talk because I'm going to go back to it more than once. There are some immediate consequences of it. For example, it follows that a definable family of sets in a minimal structure extends to a definable type if and only if it admits a finer downward directed family, right? Now, this is, this is kind of interesting because it's a way of describing that a family extends to a definable type sort of like within the structure. And it, it's connected to something called pro-definability of types that, that people like uh, Pablo Covides, Vincent Ye, and Martin Hills are studying. But I don't really want to get into this kind of corollary here. Instead, I want to get a bit more topological and talk about how we can use theorem A to characterize a notion of definable compactness for or minimal definable topologies. All right. So the final topologies, what is a, a definable topology? A topological space X tau is definable if it has a basis that is definable, right? So we have a basis of opens for the topology and as a collection of sets, this basis has to be definable. So some examples in a minimal structures, we have the canonical or minimal Euclidean topology, of course. We have the definable manifold spaces, such as the definable groups. We could be working with uh, the final spaces of CR functions with R norms, which are examples of the final metrics, which were studied by Eric Wasberg in his PhD thesis. And then we have uh, spaces that are not really metrizable, like the split interval, Alexandrov double circle, the Moore plane. These are classical spaces in topology that are definable in the field of reals. Outside of minimality, we have the valuation topology in a value field. And moreover, say we are in the complex plane with a unary predicate for the reals, the, the plane topology is also going to be definable. So what we want, we have all these uh, examples, so the final topologies, and what we want is a usable notion of definable compactness. And it should be a first order property. It should be somehow captured by the theory of the underlying structure. So for example, if a space is definably compact and you move to an elementary extension and, the, and, and you can move to that space inside the extension, it should maintain the, that property, in this case, definable compactness. So I'm gonna present three definitions for, uh, for definable compactness that have proven themselves quite, quite useful in, in different tame topological settings. And the first one is the one that I'm going to call definable compactness and it says the following, a definable topological space X tau is definably compact if every downward directed definable family of closed sets has non-empty intersection. And this is, a, this is a rather nice definition. It has received attention in recent years by Fornacero, by Johnson, also by myself. And I'm gonna mention some, some simple facts to try and argue that this is a nice definition. The image of a definably compact space by a definable continuous function is always going to be definably compact. In a definably complete field M, any definable continuous function F from K to M, where K is definably compact, reaches its maximum and minimum. And then more, more generally, uh, definable compactness allows us to generalize results on finite families of definable sets to infinite definable families. All right, so this is our main definition, but there is, uh, there is another which I'm going to call type compactness. And first I, I, I want to, I have to introduce what I mean when I say the limit of a type. So let's be a type in some definable topological space, um, X tau um, with X in P. Sorry, uh, this sentence is not very clear. I mean, let's just, just let, uh, let P be a type, all right? With X in P, that's it. We say that little x is a limit of the type if it belongs in every closed set in the type, all right? That would be the limit of P. And the definition of type compactness is the following. A definable topological space is type compact if every definable type P that concentrates in X, so with X in P, has a limit in X. And this was the notion considered by uh, Kuchrovsky and Lesser in their book, 
non-Archimedean same topology and st uh, stably dominated types where they work in the setting of of uh, value fields and they they consider that this is the appropriate notion of the final companionness in this setting. And I want to upfront characterize this notion because the characterization here given by number two is gonna be it's gonna be very useful. So lemma one, let x tau be a definable topological space, the following are equivalent. X tau is type compact, and every definable family C of closed subsets of X that extends to a definable type has non-empty intersection. And it's pretty it's pretty easy how how this is uh, this equivalence uh, happens. Essentially, if you want to move from one to two, you have your family C, you know that it extends to a definable type, you pick a limit of that type, and that limit is clearly going to be in all the sets in your C, right? If, if you want to prove the other implication from two to one, you have your type, your definable type, and you, uh, you want to find the limit, you have to notice the following. Every, every closed set in a topological space is an intersection of basic closed sets, right? And by basic closed set, I mean the, the complement of, of, an, of an open in the basis. So it's enough to find a point in every basic closed set in, in the type to say that that point is actually the limit of the type. In other words, to say that that point is actually in every closed set in the type. But the thing is, because the topology is definable, all the basic closed sets are definable. The collection of all of them is definable. So you can apply two. You can find uh, a point here in this intersection where this C would, would be all the basic closed sets in the type. And that point is actually going to be the limit of your type. And that, that's how you would argue that number two here implies type compactness. So with that, we have two notions so far, one that I call the final compactness, one that I call type compactness. I want to briefly address a third one, which is a, sort of like the standard one in the minimal setting, which I call curve compactness. Uh, a space is curve compact if every definable curve is completable, which means essentially that it has a limit on both sides. And, and again, this is a standard notion in you know, minimality was introduced for definable manifold spaces for the Euclidean topology. And, and I, I want to briefly say when it comes to the Euclidean topology in a minimal structure, uh, these three notions are equivalent to just saying closed and bounded. But the problem is if you're working in, in other topologies, say a manifold topology, there's no obvious notion of boundedness, you have to look for other alternatives, right? All right, so these are the notions and what is the use of theorem A? Well, theorem A is gonna be useful essentially to prove the equivalence between the final compactness and type compactness. So here we're back at theorem A. And the corollary is the following. Let M be an minimal structure and let X tau be a definable topological space. The following are equivalent. X tau is definably compact. X tau is type compact. And here we have the characterization of type compactness given by the previous lemma. And proving this is not difficult if we remember theorem A, which again had two parts. First part, that one directed definable family extends always to definable type. And the second part, saying that any uh, definable family S on some definable type can always be refined to a downward directed one. So how do we use that to prove corollary two? Say we have, want to prove that two implies one and let's see be a definable downward directed family of closed sets. And we want to show that it has non empty intersection. Well, by the theorem, we know that it extends to a definable type. So what we have to do is pick a limit of that type and there you go, that's a, a point in the intersection. Now to show that one implies two, we start with C, a definable family of closed sets that extends to a definable type. And using the theorem, we pass to the refinement. We let S be a finer, definable downward directed family. And then we consider this family F prime. We take the closure of all the sets in F. And this new family is still going to be downward directed. It's still going to be finer than C, but now it only contains closed sets. 
So we apply the definition of the final compactness. There exists a point here in this intersection. And then clearly this uh, little x is, is also going to be in all the sets in C. So that's how the corollary um, works and how you prove this equivalence from our theorem A. Now, before I stop talking about compactness, I want to say something else. I have to introduce this, this class of theories that, that goes beyond the minimality. So let B denote uh, the union of the following classes of deep minimal theories. They're going to be linearly ordered deep minimal theories and packable BC minimal theories and deep minimal theories with definable scaling functions. So this, I think this essentially covers all the main examples of DP minimal theories. Uh, so this would be weakly or minimal, ACBF, strongly minimal, um, the fields of the addicts also. In fact, I think the only example that might not be covered here, and that's DP minimal, might be the additive group of the addicts with, with evaluation. So in this setting, what Simon and Tarchenko proved in 2014 is the following. Suppose that the theory of M is in D and let S be a consistent, the finable family of sets. Remember, consistent means it has a finite intersection property. Then S can be partitioned into finitely many subfamilies, each of which extends to a definable type. Now, this is not really what, uh, what Simon and Tarchenko proved. They actually, what they did is they characterized forking and dividing in this setting. But this is a rewriting of, of that result. And in fact, the consistency assumption here, it can be weakened to a, to a simpler, to a weaker intersection property. But we're going to stick with this because it's, it's really what, what we're interested in. And this clearly has a corollary in terms of understanding type compactness. But first, uh, uh, Pablo? Yes. Can I ask what is unpackable? Unpackable. So uh, when you have a BC minimal theory, you have a generating family of sets, right? Right. And this generating family of sets, you know, it's what's called, I think it's called directed. They have this nice intersection property between them. I think any two are either disjoint or one is contained in the other, right? Something like this. Mm. The thing about unpackable, unpackability is that um, any possible generating family of sets in our BC minimal theory cannot be, has the property that one of these generating uh, sets is not the union of finally many others proper that are proper. So it's not the union of finally many other subsets that are also generating sets. Okay, it's like uh, irreducible, there was an irreducible generating family, something like this. Something like this, yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, and, and the reason, yeah, the, the reason what they say in this paper in this, the additive group of the addicts is just, it's busy minimal, but it's, it's packable, it's not unpackable. So, all right, so we have our theorem three, and for now let me, let me say what a transversal is. Even a family of sets S, a, trans, a set T is a transversal for S if it intersects every set in S, all right? And I'm interested about the property of having a finite transversal. So whenever, when T is finite. And if you think about this, this essentially means that there are finally many points and every set in your family is going to contain at least one of these points. So the corollary is the following. Suppose that the theory, the theory of M is in D, and let C be a consistent definable family of closed sets in some type compact definable topology. Then C has a finite transversal. So why does this happen? We have our family C, it is consistent. We apply theorem three, we have this, uh, this partition, right? In finally many subfamilies, each of which extends to a definable type. But then by type compactness, each of these subfamilies have non-empty intersection. So you pick a point, in the intersection of each of these subfamilies, and with that you construct a finite transversal. So with that, we have uh, this characterization of the final compactness in minimality. So suppose that M is so minimal, we have a definable topological space, the following are equivalent, 
the space is definably compact, the space is tight compact, any consistent definable family of closed sets has a finite transversal. And moreover, all of, all of the above imply, and if C is Hausdorff or M has a finite choice, are equivalent to being uh, curve compact. So in general, curve compact is a bit weaker, but most of the time it's also going to be equivalent. Now, our theorem A is useful to prove the equivalence between one and two, right? And then the result from, um, from Simon and Starchenko is useful to bridge the gap from two to three. All right, so that's what I wanted to say essentially about uh, the final compactness in a minimality. I'm going to go back to theorem A and I'm going to give some insights into its proof. I'm going to start with the first part. You have a downward directed definable family, it always extends to a definable type. So, this actually is something that we know is true in the whole class D of theories that I've uh, presented before. And the reason is precisely by the Simon Strachenko theorem. Suppose that the theory of M belongs in D, then every downward directed definable family of sets extends to a definable type. So theorem A1 holds in this setting that generalizes for minimality. And the proof is quite simple. By Simon Strachenko, if S is a downward directed, um, then there exist finally many definable types, P1, Pn, such that every set in S belongs in some Pi, right? That's what the theorem says. We claim that the whole family has to belong in one of the Pi. Otherwise, for every I, we can find a set that omits that Pi, but then by downward directedness, we can find another set that is a subset of the intersection of all the sets we have constructed. And this set, in theory, would um, avoid every type PI for every I. And this is a contradiction, right? So because of downward directedness, the whole family has to belong in one of the types. So because of this, uh, theorem A1 is not something I'm going to talk so much about because I already know it, it works in this, uh, in this rather general setting. By the way, the theorem of Simon Starchenko, it, it's conjectured that it's true in all DP minimal theories. So theorem A1, it might be true in all, uh, all DP minimal theories. However, I do want to mention something about the minimal proof of this result, because I think it's interesting that it follows from some topological axioms. In the minimal case, the proof of theorem A1 relies on two facts. First, the fact that we have small boundaries. For any definable set X, the dimension of the frontier of X is always strictly less than the dimension of X. And second, for any definable family S, there exists N, such that every set in S has at most N definably connected components. So as I said, what I find interesting about this is that it's a, it's a topological proof, that right? It's based on this, on this sort of like same topology axiom. And the first one in particular is, is rather, it, it's rather popular even outside the minimality. And you, we've seen it when dealing with DP minimal value fields and, and these kinds of settings. The second one, however, is not something that really works for value fields. So if you wanted to use this kind of facts to prove uh, the, the result, you have to find something that works that is not this uh, condition on, on the finally connected components. In value fields, uh, everything is, is totally disconnected, essentially. And now I'm going to, I'd like to move to the second part, right? Which said, once again, for any definable type P and definable family of sets S in P, there exists a downward directed definable family F that is finer than S. And this is something I asked in a, in a paper I published uh, with, with Margaret Thomas and Eric Walsberg years ago. And in the first version, it was a conjecture and then I proved it. And afterwards, but we didn't update the archive and Will Johnson sent us a proof by email. And this, that's the proof I'm actually going to present because I think Will's proof gives some extra insight about something called reducibility that I want to, I want to talk about. So say that a family of sets S is reducible if the intersection of any two sets in S is a finite union of sets from S. For example, all, all intervals in a linear order, right? 
And the key observation here is the following. The restriction of a type to a re redivisible family of definable sets is always downward directed. Why? Well, you pick two sets in your family that are in the type, the intersection is going to be on the type, but this intersection is covered by finally many sets from the family. So at least one of them has to be in the type, right? And that's how you get the downward directedness. So what Johnson noted is the following. If M is so minimal, then for any definable family of sets S, there exists a re redivisible definable family of cells C, such that every set in S is a finite union of cells from C. In particular, if S extends to a definable type P, then the restriction of P to C is going to be a definable downward directed family finer than S. So we have theorem A2. So I'm gonna be going back to this idea in Johnson's proof, finding a redivisible family and then any, any set in my initial family S is a finite union of sets from your redivisible family. But before that, I wanna give some brief insights about how Johnson's proof, what, what, what makes his proof work. Uh, and it's the same reason my, my own proof of this result works. It has to do with the minimal cell decomposition. And in particular, the following. For a partial function f from m to the n, uh, from m to the n to m, let us use this, this typical notation, right? This generalized interval notation to mean all the tuples x t where x is in the domain of f and t is less than f of x. The key fact in proving theorem A2 is that the minimality allows reducing the question to the case where s is a family of the form, well, given by sets of this form. And these sets are simple in the following sense. For any two sets of this form, and for any x in the domain of both functions, the sets, uh, essentially the fibers at x of these sets are nested, which means that one is always going to be a subset of the other. And that's essentially it. In other words, for any x in the projection of the intersection of these two sets, the fibers at x are nested, right? It's that simple fact that really makes the proof, uh, which is of course rather, it's not something that's gonna be intuitive from this fact, but it's really, this is what makes the proof work. And then of course, the fact that, you know, these kinds of sets have a crucial part defining open cells and then cells, of course, in minimality, they, they have a part in, 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 in describing every definable set. So these are the insights I wanted to give about the proof of this result. And I wanna spend the last um, almost 15 minutes, 13, talking about the setting. Uh, so whether this result might be true beyond the minimality. And uh, I've already said something about theorem A1, right? Because of Simon Estorchenko, it's, we, know, we already know it's true in this large class of TP minimal theory. So I'm gonna focus on the second part, on theorem A2. I'm gonna start with this conjecture and this conjecture is based on the insights I have just given about the minimal proof of theorem A2. Suppose that there exists a collection of formulas by I uh, with, uh, with the length of X equals one such that for every I, the family defined on M by the formula uh, by sub I is nested. Again, this means that any two sets, one has to be a subset of the other. And suppose that in any model, N of the theory of M in a unary definable set is a Boolean combination of sets defined by one of these formulas. Then theorem A2 holds in M. So every definable set, a family of sets that extends to a definable type can be refined to a downward directed family. And this is a conjecture because uh, I have to, you know, sit down and see if it, everything works out and, and I can, I can man manage to prove it. But, it's interesting to think where would this, where does this hold? Which theories does this hold? So we have these formulas, they are nested and they are like the building blocks of every unary definable set. It sounds a bit like busy minimality, but in busy minimality, the generating formulas, they don't have to be uniformly nested in this sense. 
right? And I don't think it's the case in like, for example, the Piadics. But I, I believe this conjecture would apply to weakly or minimal theories, right? For example, take all the formulas defining left and bounded intervals. But um, so what about the Piadics? And that's, uh, that's the next thing I want to talk about. So a periodically closed field is a model of the theory of the periodics, right? And Johnston and Zhao re recently last year proved the following. Let M be a periodically closed field. A subspace Y of a definable manifold space is definably compact even only if any or every one dimensional definable type P with Y in P has a limit in Y. So one dimensional, uh, it means that the type has one dimensional sets, essentially. And so you don't care about every definable type having a limit, only one dimensional ones. So this upfront is a bit weaker than type compactness. We're, we'd also, we are also not focusing on any definable topology, but on these manifold uh, spaces on the PIX. But I thought this was uh, a bit promising. And I, I've been discussing this with, uh, with Will and I don't know if he would, if he would actually call this a conjecture, but he does think it might be true that theorem A2 holds sympathetically closed fields. So in particular, definable compactness and type compactness are equivalent for all definable topological spaces, right? Uh, so this is something he thinks it might follow from some work he's done and some work he's currently doing on, on the setting of periodically closed fields. But you know, he, he gave me some insights, but still a bit obscure to me, the whole thing at this point, uh, I've been trying to, I've been essentially interested in knowing whether there is a bridge between that possible proof in the Piatic case and the minimal proof, or the possible proof in the weekly or minimal case. And at this point, I, I don't really know if there's a common argument, but I was discussing this with him and we noted, we were thinking about theorem A2, and we noted this kind of thing, it, it's not going to work in like strongly minimal theories and it doesn't work in ACDF. But what Will Johnson thought is maybe it's something about distality. It's something about distal theories that makes uh, this result hold. And that's, uh, that's the next thing I want to talk about, about distal cell decomposition. So let F be a finite family of the finite subsets of MN. An abstract cell decomposition for F is a finite family C of the final subsets of MN, satisfying the following, the union of all of them has to be MN. And moreover, for every set F in our family and every cell, so the sets in C here, we'll call them cells, either the cell is contained in F or both are disjoint. And that's it. So it's a very weak, very abstract notion we have no geometric assumptions on cells or anything like that. We're only asking that cells are compatible with the sets in F and that they cover the whole space, that's it. So for example, here we have four cells in red, right? And say that the circles in black are the sets in F. And this would be like a minimal, right? Like a minimal abstract cell decomposition. We're just picking the Boolean atoms here as the cells. But we could have more. We don't need to have uh, the minimal one. Uh, by the way, they, they, the cells, they don't have to, they, they can intersect each other, all right? They don't have to be disjoint like in the picture here. The important thing I wanted to note is, note that the intersection of these two circles is going to be covered by finally many cells. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be important. So what is distal cell decomposition? Which is, by the way, it's also the definition of distality, like a, a structure is distal if and only if it has distal cell decomposition. So let M be distal, like for example, weakly or minimal uh, theories or theoretically closed. For any definable family of sets S in M, there exists a definable family D satisfying that for any finite F uh, subfamily of S, there exists an abstract cell decomposition for F given by cells in D. So no matter, no matter how many sets you pick from S, as long as there are finally many, you're always going to find an abstract cell decomposition in your D. 
So D and D is called a distal cell decomposition for S. And the observation of Will was, all right, any finite non-empty intersection of sets in S is clearly going to be a finite union of sets in D, in particular of cells in, uh, in the decomposition of those finitely many sets. And this is interesting. This might, might yield uh, something. The issue is that D, however, is not necessarily redivisible. And that's a problem, right? Because what, what uh, Will showed in the minimal case is that you could have something or not as strong as this, not like a distal cell decomposition where the, the union of all the cells is, is the whole space. But he showed that you had this uh, redivisible family of cells that essentially um, refined our initial family, right? In the sense that every set in our initial family was a finite union of of uh, cells but here we have our distal cell decomposition which is which is going to refine any any set from s but the, the family itself might not be redivisible we can build a sequence right d1 d2 and so on where dj is a distal cell decomposition of the i for i less than j but there's as far as we know there is no assurance that this sequence will become constant if it does if you have a family and it's a distal cell decomposition of itself, then you're good. You have um, a family that is redivisible, but upfront and as far as we know, this is not going to be the case in general. Uh, I haven't really seen any any comment about this kind of thing though in, in, in anything I've read. So I've read some papers about this. This is from Chernikov and and it, they, what they do is they try to bound the complexity of distal cell decompositions in the following sense. They are like, all right, so if you pick n sets from S, you can always find uh, an abstract cell decomposition in, in D of size, whatever. And they try to bound this number, the number of cells that you can find. But when it comes to a sequence like this one and whether the description complexity of these families is going to grow and work grow, or if it's going to sort of like stay constant and maybe in the end you have one family that, that works for itself. I don't really know whether maybe someone, um, you know, in this audience or, or elsewhere knows an example of a theory where this, this just doesn't happen. So this was, uh, this is it so far. And the only thing I wanna do is make two last observations about this quality. And one is the following condition. Suppose that M is distal and there exist finally many definable families S1, Sn of subsets of M, such that every definable subset of M is a finite Boolean combination of sets from these families. So this is a minimality condition, right? With respect to S1, Sn, like it happens and it happens in minimal structures. Then things kind of work because we can pick D, a distal cell decomposition of the union of these families. And, and because of the minimality condition, D actually contains an abstract cell decomposition for any finite family of the sub finite subsets of M. In particular, uh, D is going to be redivisible on theorem A2 holds. And this is essentially what happens in a minimality, but as, as far as I know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't apply to weak or minimality because you don't necessarily have finally many um as i said as far as you know for uh, families and and I, i've been looking at again theoretically closed fields uh, i don't think you have finally many either even though there are there are quantifier elimination results and so on so i don't know whether it's an interesting setting beyond the minimality where this condition is actually the case where you, where you have this ality and you have minimality with respect to essentially finally many formulas. The second observation is that if you only care about compactness, to prove that the finable compactness implies type compactness, it's actually enough to show the existence of a redivisible family, the finable family D, such that every basic closed set in your topology is a finite union of sets in D. So our, our theorem A2 is, is basically thinking about any, any family and any type. But if you only care about trying to prove this implication between different notions of the final compactness, you only have to look 
at the family of basic closed sets. So for example, say that M expands a linear order and that the collection of all convex sets is definable. Um, if you think about the order topology, then is any basic closed set in the order topology is, is a whole line minus an interval. So it's a union of two intervals. In other words, uh, for any definable X in M, if the order topology on X is definably compact, then it is type compact. Because you can just pick that collection, the collection of all convex sets. Sorry, I'm saying interval here, but I mean convex sets. And the collection of all convex sets is going to be sort of, it's going to refine, uh, not refine, but it's going to have this property that it is redivisible. And moreover, any basic closed set is going to be union of finally many, in particular, two convex sets. And that was, the, that was the second observation. So I'm going to leave you with some questions. Essentially, does theorem A hold in all distal structures? Or more generally, where does theorem A hold beyond the minimality? And more in topological terms, what characterization of the final compactness is available in other generalizations of a minimality. For example, I've been thinking a bit about structures with a minimal open core, and whether some of these arguments, some of the minimal arguments still apply there, but I ask my own questions in, in, that, in that setting. And then we have, you know, the minimal noiseless type A structures. This is essentially things I, I learned about in Philip's talk from a few, from last month. But I thought it sounded very interesting and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this course on all these things and learning a bit more. And, see if uh, anything interesting can be said in these settings. And um, that, that's essentially it. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Pablo. Mm -hmm.